Welcome to our uh, panel this afternoon on critical surveillance inquiry. Um, I'm just going to introduce a little bit of good systems and what we're doing here and then uh, you know, sort of the logistics of it and then going to hand it right over to Simone Brown. Um, so this panel has uh, is under the umbrella of the good systems bridging barriers challenge um, where our mission is uh, thinking about the design of AI technologies that benefit society um, and the extent to which those are good systems. Um, our, our event today is in one of the research areas of good systems called critical surveillance inquiry. Um, and alongside that, we wanted uh, our participants to have access to a um, really interesting documentary about critical surveillance studies, essentially, and the work that is out in the world called Coded Bias. Um, and I think Allison is going to put information for how you can get access to that in the chat. There it is. Um, coded Bias is, it is a documentary about that explores the fallout of MIT Media Lab researcher Joy Boylamwini's discovery that facial recognition does not see dark skin faces accurately and her journey to push for the first ever legislation in the US to govern against bias and the algorithms that impact us all. So um, some of you may have watched it before the talk today and that can inform your, your interaction with us. Uh, and some of you may watch it after. We have it available to us until Monday, I think. Um, so without any further ado, I'm going to um, let our panelists introduce themselves um, but I can tell you very briefly, uh, it will be Simone Brown um, and then Yvonne Lopez, uh, Yvonne Chard Lopez, and then Sam Levine, and finally Aaron McElroy, all UT fabulous researchers and scholars. Uh, and without any, uh, each of them are going to actually speak for about eight minutes. Uh, they'll screen share and advance their, their own slides. Uh, and then after that, we'll have a Q&A with everybody um, where I will, with the help of Allison, who's been wonderful um, this entire time, Allison Fiorenza, uh, she's going to help us sort of pick out some, some questions from the audience so you guys can actually put them in the Q&A box and we will moderate those after our panelists give their brief um, talks. So without any further ado, I will hand it over to Simone. Thank you so much, Tanya. And uh, thank you to all of you all for joining us um, on wherever it is that you are connected to this um, Zoom. I'm really excited for this discussion um, today. So I'm Simone Brown. I'm, prof I'm a professor at UT Austin in Black Studies. And I'm the director this year of Critical Surveillance Inquiry, which is a, a, which is a research uh, area uh, focused within good systems. And it's a research focus that we work with scholars, organizations, communities, and to curate conversations such as this one today, as well as um, exhibitions, research, that examine the social and ethical implications of surveillance technologies, both AI technologies or those that aren't enabled by AI, sorry. So we focus on algorithmic bias, harm, tech equity, and we continually question what's good uh, in order to better understand the development and impact of artificial intelligence and other emerging technologies. I'm gonna share my screen here today, and I'm really excited to be here uh, with these particular panelists who are my colleagues, new and some not so new at UT, who are you know really, uh, researchers, organizers, artists, activists, thinkers, creators, who I really um, am excited to be in conversation with because I admire their work um, so much. And so I, I ask questions about surveillance. I'll just start from the start. And I'm kind of, I guess, a Luddite of these tech things, but let it in the way of, you know, questioning what is the political value and goals of, and even social goods of some of these technologies that we have now, including Zoom. So I wanted to put together for about eight minutes, um, these, where I'm seeing my work now, and I just three key words, art, invention, and work. 
And so surveillance is, uh, has been made really a fact of Black life. Um, and what's important to me is Black uh, invention, uh, Black creation and art, and the various ways that Black folks uh, trouble the very surveillance technologies and its methods, and insist on making ways to imagine and live uh, life beyond an anti-Black surveillance state. And so, for example, um, I like the, this work by uh, Mary Van Britton Brown. She's often absented in the archive of our contemporary ring doorbells and other types of um, home surveillance system. But in 1969, she put together a patent and filed one for what she called a home security based system uh, based on television surveillance. And so there's really hardly any work published on her um, development of this, uh, this technology, which we can see is a really a pre cursor to contemporary home monitoring systems, video doorbells, um, other home DVR for the consumer markets. And so I, I take this to think about the ways that uh, Black women's own invention and creation and theorizing of the very methods of surveillance often gets absented um, you know, from the historical archives. And so I try to center those types of creations and inventions and the questions that I'm asking. So she was a nurse by profession, and I'd like to imagine this, you know, not like as a, a ring doorbell, which has its, um, you know, ties to our contemporary carceral um, moment and policing, but I'd like to imagine that she, you know, came up with this idea collaboratively with other nurses that she worked the night shift with, and that they thought of this technology as a way outside of calling the police, and perhaps a strategy of, of self-defense that was about, um, you know, abolition and mutual aid. Another uh, moment of creation actually came out of my class. Um, this is a anti-surveillance fashion, uh, a jacket, denim jacket with spikes designed by um, uh, OS. Uh, this was a fall of 20, uh, 2019, OS in Gunyamuyua. And um, they designed this piece to really uh, get us to think about massage noir and uh, street harassment. And other artists that I've been um, and creators that I've been interested in include, um, you know, uh, this work here by um, artist uh, Kapwani Kawanga, Safe Passage. And this is her take on uh, lantern laws from the 18th century in spaces like New York City or Boston that required that um, uh, black indigenous, uh, black and indigenous people who were enslaved were to carry with them if after dark and if, if they weren't in the company of, you know, some white person a lantern. And so the lantern itself became like a, an appendage, a supervisory device um, to light up the, the Black and Indigenous body um, as, a, as a form of security. Um, and so those are the ways in, you can think about the lantern as like the a precursor or a formation to something like um, the slide in the middle, which was taken from uh, Instagram. And this is when NYPD, uh, you know, puts their floodlights into people's uh, homes. I mean, you, you could think about stop and frisk, or even, you know, in Canada, in Nova Scotia, they have laws against, you know, tinted windows that often, you know, focus on black drivers, driving while black, walking like while black, all of these things that the kind of criminalizing of black movement and black mobilities have long histories. And so I always ask, you know, what can the past tell us about our present and how can the past inform our critique of contemporary um, surveillance uh, technologies? I'll move on here. Uh, this is a really exciting piece by um, a, a collective of artists. Um, and this, this is another use of light. Um, in this case, it's a mounted uh, GoPro camera. And this is called um, Coding, Braiding tr and Transmissions. Uh, it's a collaborative installation by Tamar Clark Brown and Isaac Karayuki. And it's, it explores, um, as they write, the potential dynamic between braiding hair and coding as a tool for in sending encrypted messages and resistive political actions, end quote. And you can see from the images here that these are Black women's uh, braiding each other's hair. Um, as, and the, the idea is that their motions are captured in some machine readable way, which are then turned into bits of code. And so Black women's care work around hair braiding and the shared intimacies of this act, especially when Black women's hair is often circumscribed as dangerous in schools, you know, at airports, uh, in places of employment, um, this is a way of, you know, breaking that narrative uh, and thinking about, uh, you know, digital self-defense, encryption and decryption, and these close networks of care. And so 
skipping from that and but I'll tie it together somewhere in my mind at some place. A couple years ago, um, I traveled to um, Accra, uh, Ghana. And so one of the questions that shaped my interest um, in AI in particular um, is, you know, what happens when Alexa goes to Accra? So meaning there could be like no big data, no artificial intelligence or machine learning um, without like, for example, like Siri or Alexa and other types of voice control digital assistance without the machinery, without the hardware that make up, make these things up. And I'm really indebted to the work of uh, Kay Crawford here and Vlad and Joler in their anatomy of AI. When they ask about the impacts, at, really they map the impacts of the life cycle of an Amazon uh, echo through the lens of extraction, uh, labor extraction, data extraction, um, the extraction of planetary um, resources. So Agwagoshi Ghana is part market and also part um, electronic waste site. It's homes to schools, uh, businesses, residential areas, and it's a population of about 50,000 um, people. And I really wanted to go there to, 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 to get to understand some of the you know, self-taught computer engineers that are really taking this discarded um, waste that's coming from spaces like the UK, America, um, Canada, uh, England or so, Europe, to sites like, like this one, but also in the Philippines, China, to then be you know, they're coming there at uh, end of life, but then perhaps to be uh, repurposed, uh, de dealt, dismantled. Um, and I, I was interested in the self-taught engineers who are basically rebuilding, as you can see from the, um, the second slide from the right, uh, uh, waste uh, end of life um, computers. But it's also concerned about, you know, our own accountability, our own complicity when it comes to the health effects of the people who do this, you know, loosely regulated um, waste work. And so, um, you know, when it comes to this dismantling, the burning, all of these um, things um, really speak to the occupational and health and safety risks associated with this type of, you know, exposure to um, the remnants of secondhand uh, consumer uh, electronic goods. And so I think I'm about at um, eight minutes now, but, you know, I, whether it's uh, through art, through invention, or through the kind of remaking, I think it's still uh, important when we question, you know, AI and not to think of it solely as something that is um, artificial, but to think about the labor, the creative labor and the extractive labor and the debts that, you know, we owe when we think about something like this image of garbage imperialism. Uh, thank you. And so I'll hand over the screen to the next panelist. Yes, so that is uh, me. Let me share my screen as well. Is everybody seeing my slides? And um, can I get a cue from folks in the panel? Yes, we can see them. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, so good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I want to start off by thanking the folks at um, the Good Systems here at UT, especially uh, Simone, Allison, and Andrea for um, the invitation to share a bit of my work, um, as well as for putting this panel together. Um, so my name is Ivan Char Lopez. I am an assistant professor in digital studies in the Department of American Studies um, at UT. I'm also um, the uh, lead investigator at the Border Tech Lab, which um, I lead uh, here at UT. Um, my scholarly training is in history, American studies, and science and technology studies, and I ventured into these disciplines or fields um, in part because of my interest in thinking about how humans make meaning, um, how humans make sense of themselves, those around them, and their places through a range of practices. Um, now, my research focuses on the politics of digital technologies. And this focus and my training led me to think about the relation between racial formation and technology. And by this, I mean the role of information technologies in the processes that create racial identities and categories that are lived out, reproduced, transformed, and contested. So I'll give you an example. Throughout the 20th and 21st centuries, the US-Mexico border has been framed by narratives of crisis, 
that help justify the application of new, oftentimes harsh measures as means for gaining control over it. From the militarized practices of border policing during the Mexican Revolution, to the Trump administration's construction of hundreds of miles of border wall, a range of actors imagined the border as a frail and dangerous articulation of national sovereignty that requires robust and intense action. Their efforts confirm that the border is not some natural phenomenon, but a carefully, even if unstable and contingent social construction. How the border is produced and what are some of its political aims become organizing questions for me. As a result, my work centers on surveillance operations since the mid 20th century as a way of enacting the national boundary. So US nation making in the 1960s and 1970s was deeply informed by the discursive treatment of some migrants as threats. In part, this was the result of World War II's racial politics of immigration with ethnic, ethnic Japanese, both US citizens and non-US citizens who were treated as uh, so-called disloyal subjects. With approval of the Alien Registration Act of 1940, the federal government required that all non-US citizens in the country register at their local post office by filling out a questionnaire with biographical and biometric information. In addition to the registration forms, Immigration and Naturalization Service, or INS, and other federal agencies developed techniques for identifying seemingly loyal non-citizens from disloyal non-citizens with, uh, with such artifacts as loyalty questionnaires and immigration identification cards. Among these documents was the widely known green card. Now, despite the fact that the war effort also monitored ethnic Germans and ethnic Italians. It was ethnic Japanese who were especially targeted through different means, including concentration camps. And treating specific racialized populations as a threat or a potential threat to the nation, INS normalized a politics of enmity as a governing framework for immigration enforcement. By the 1960s and 1970s, ethnic Mexicans and Latin Americans more broadly were the racialized threat to control. Racial slurs like wetbacks, the gaslighting use of illegals, and the wide inflected narrative of unfair class competition for US citizens permeated much public conversation. This led INS to figure out how to get the racialized threat under the control and in the process, produce a national border that effectively identifies and filter those that should be included from those that ought to be excluded from the nation. Cybernetics and information um, theory together were leveraged by INS to help reorganize old and develop new mechanisms through which racial control could be exerted. This was in part the product of growing collaborations between the Department of Defense, Defense Industries and Think Tanks, and the INS. These collaborations led to the development of what I call the cybernetic border, a socio-technical arrangement centered on data capture, management, and processing meant to institute racial order on the borderlands and consequently produce the border. The cybernetic border that emerged in the 20th century continues to this day through the entanglement of a range of information technologies construed as central to border and immigration enforcement. So here you see the difference between this kind of initial iteration of the cybernetic border and the more contemporary iteration of the cybernetic border. There are definitely differences, but there are also um, a lot of uh, similarities. So from drones and CCTV systems to facial recognition technologies at ports of entry and OCR readable identity documents, the cybernetic border has become the governing organization of border and immigration enforcement. The book I'm working on preliminary titled The Cybernetic Border, Drones, Technology and Intrusion examines this history to interrogate our contemporary moment by tracing the co-production of technoscience and differential treatments, it shows how imperial formations are infrastructural arrangements, 
Hence, the issue of the embedding of values in systems is of critical importance in moving forward to articulate a different kind of world. So that's where I'll stop. And I think uh, Sam goes next. Hi. Hi, everyone. These things are always so awkward. I love it. Um, OK. Um, I'm just going to share my screen. Uh, and great. OK. Um, uh, first, yeah, thank you so much for having me. Um, my name is Sam Levine. I'm an assistant professor uh, in the design department here at UT Austin. Um, I sometimes call myself an internet artist, which is like, who even knows what that means in, in 2021. But you know, for me, it's like my work is primarily about the internet and it's also primarily on the internet. And I'm really motivated by